ancient Egyptian civilization lasted more than 3,500 years, one of the most enduring cultures of all time. Yet its people wanted more. They wished to live forever. And no Egyptian craved immortality more urgently than the pharaohs. Their remarkable temples and monuments were created to protect the king and his life after death. Yet in all the land of ancient Egypt, from the Mediterranean to Nubia in the south, only one king's mummy lay undisturbed into the modern day. Here, far to the south of the pyramids, in the Valley of the Kings, the discovery of that tomb would stun the world. The year is 1922. Archaeology has arrived in Egypt like an invading army. Hordes of Europeans comb the desert for the most coveted prize of all, an unopened royal tomb. Howard Carter, an experienced Egyptologist, has spent years looking for the tomb of one minor pharaoh. The little-known ruler's name was Tutankhamun, King Tut. He was down to nobody. This was the tenth year. The money was running out. He was a romantic. Uh, you have to be to remain in Egypt that long. Driven. He always knew that Tut was there. Carter's big break came in the first days of his sixth expedition. He discovered indications of a crypt that lay buried beneath a later pharaoh's tomb, an accident of fate that had kept it hidden from grave robbers for centuries. After so many years in the desert, all that stood between Carter and what could be the discovery of a lifetime was a wall sealed with plaster more than three millennia ago. Carter had no intention of letting the finer points of the law slow him down. Without proper authority from the Egyptian officials, he began to chip away at the wall. They didn't tell us so, you know. And then he opens the thing up, and the rush of ancient air comes out, and the smell of all of those things in there. There cannot be imagined a more dramatic moment in the history of archaeology. You can imagine the feeling. The first thing they saw were these huge uh, ceremonial couches, the ones in the shape of the bull and the tiger with the inlaid of the blue glass still preserved. <laughs> Nobody had ever seen the likes of that, even in reliefs or paintings in the tombs, nothing like that. When King Tut prepared for eternity, he brought with him all the comforts of home, baskets and pots, toys and cooking utensils, food and weapons, even clay models of servants to wait on him in death as they had in life. Anything useful here in this life would surely be needed in the next. But about the king himself, very little is known. Only that he was 18 or 19 when he died and that he had a young wife. Even the mummies of two babies, also found in the crypt, remain orphans of the mysteries surrounding the young pharaoh's life. But one thing was clear. Tut's tomb was designed as a gateway to eternity a storehouse of sacred and magical items for his journey into the afterlife.
You have weapons that nobody ever knew existed. You have fine bows. You have a piece of steel on his heart, in the most precious place, in the deepest uh, level of King Tut. They found a piece of steel, a little tiny miniature knife in steel, which was considered to be more valuable than all the gold that they found. It was in the great nested shrine that the most magnificent treasures and King Tut's mummy were found. The innermost of four ornate coffins was solid gold. But it was not enough to assure Tut's place in eternity. His mummy was shattered as soon as Carter unwrapped it searching for the king's jewelry. Sadly, King Tut would be remembered not as a pharaoh, not even as a man, but as a treasure. It appealed to everybody's sense of uh, finding the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, and what would they find? They didn't know and it became a wild press event. Probably one of the first true pop media events of the 20th century. Dateline, Egypt. In the shadows of the silent sphinx and the gigantic pyramids that stood as lonely sentinels over the vast stretch of burning sand, an English archeological expedition headed by a man named Howard Carter sought to uncover the tomb of an ancient Egyptian It was one Dr. hell of a news story. I mean, this was top stuff. No treasure, before or since, compares with what Carter had found. Again, we get back to this sense that this was for human beings and they had used it. The little tiny toys in this tomb have marks of Tut as a kid having bounced them around. The weapons had been used. Some of the arrows had been, you know, slightly dented. He was out there practicing. That, I think, is the, 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 the gripping humanity of it. When you see the portraits, when you see in King Tut this lovely golden throne where the young king and his bride, same age, 13 or 14, having a good deal of fun. They obviously love each other. One is touching the other in the most affectionate way. In life, King Tut ruled all of Egypt. In death, he aspired to an eternal life as lavish as the royal court he left behind. Like all ancient Egyptians, Tut believed death was a journey across the Nile, a passage from the land of the living in the east to life everlasting on the river's western shore. The Nile, it was the soul of Egypt, the sacred link between the land of the living and the land of the dead. The Egyptians lived on the eastern side, but whether you were a pharaoh buried in a pyramid or a commoner laid to rest in the sand, you hoped to be buried on the Nile's western shore. In its constant and dependable rhythms, the river provided the basis for their belief in a passage from this life to the next, from one shore to the other a passage to eternity. The Nile was the vein for the heart of the Egyptian. The water which is coming from the flood, it's red. Red is fertile. This is the mud that's going to, going to give to feed the land of Egypt. The ancient Egyptian's oldest myth, the story of creation, was set amid the swirling waters of the Nile.
In the beginning, it is the great god Horus, the falcon god, that brings power to the pharaohs. Horus is the god of the skies, but he invests the pharaohs with dominion over the land and the people. On temple walls, the faithful commemorate the power of the Nile, the source of all life and the path to immortality. The Nile's water, the sacred bond uniting the pharaohs and their people from the moment of creation to the present day. If you go to any village in Upper and Modern Egypt, uh, you will find there is big similarities between uh, ancient and modern. There is continuation between the past and the present. Tomb models buried with mummies of wealthy landowners depict details of a working Egyptian farm. It is a rare glimpse into the texture of life 4,000 years ago. But the lives of the pharaoh and the farmer had little in common beside their desire for eternal life. And no element separated them more than stone. For stone was the embodiment of every pharaoh's power and his greatest weapon against time. The overriding mission of each new king was to secure the quarries that would provide raw material for monuments to his reign. This obelisk would have been the tallest in the ancient world, but a flaw in the granite caused it to crack before it was completed. How its massive 1,200 tons would have been moved and raised into place remains a mystery. In ancient Egypt, stone was the medium of immortality. It was stone that assured the king's name would be remembered, his immortality guaranteed. And one pharaoh surpassed all others in his efforts to be remembered. His name is Ramses the Great. The greatest builder in Egypt's history, Ramses ruled until his 90th year. His harem overflowed with queens, lesser wives, and concubines, and included three daughters and a sister. He was father to more than 90 children, but his greatest legacy was left in stone. As a great general motivates his troops for battle, Ramsey's most inspirational words were for his builders. O oh, my chosen workmen, valiant men of proven skill, craftsmen in valuable stone, I am your constant provider. The granaries groan with grain for you. None of you need to pass the night in hunger. But even Ramsey's stone monuments would lose the battle against his ultimate enemy, time. Across the river from Luxor, in the temple built to preserve his memory, Ramsey's fallen statue lies broken, his features worn away his head resting at the feet of god figures whose powers could not protect the legacy of Egypt's mightiest king. The temple where the name Ramses would be kept alive forever now stands empty. What became of Ramses' treasures? Where are his worldly goods? Where is his golden mask? Only this survives. This is the naked mummy 
of the once mighty Ramses. His body bears witness to a fate Egypt's mightiest ruler could never have foretold. By the year 550 AD, the golden age of Egyptian civilization had passed. A waning Roman Empire now ruled Egypt. With the Romans came Christianity. The ancient faith in reincarnation and immortality was banned. Still, one last bastion of Egypt's ancient knowledge and beliefs remained. This secluded shrine named the Temple of Philae. Inside these walls, priests kept the ancient faith alive. They still prayed to the goddess Isis, mother of Horus, the falcon god, and still practiced the rituals that promised immortality. Only in the temple of Philae were the mysteries of the ancient gods still respected and revered. And only these holy men could still read the ancient writing the hieroglyphs carved upon the walls. Finally, this last remaining outpost of Egyptian civilization came under attack. of Christian zealots outraged at the continuing worship of pagan gods assaulted the priests, breaking the last living link to the pharaohs. The priests were killed or scattered. They took their knowledge of the hieroglyphs to their graves. Egypt's dreams had been destroyed. The divine secrets of sleeping pharaohs, their sacred quest for immortality, all lost, perhaps forever, beneath the drifting sands. The silence lasted 1,300 years. Then another invader arrived. In 1798, Napoleon Bonaparte brought his armies to Egypt, seeking empire and knowledge. With his soldiers came a unique group of scientists and artists to study and record the remains of ancient Egypt. A year into the French occupation, troops demolishing a wall made a remarkable discovery. They stumbled upon one of the most significant archaeological finds of all time, the Rosetta Stone. The Rosetta Stone is one of those wonderful chance archaeological discoveries which change history. Without accident, archaeology would never have happened. All the greatest discoveries, many of them, have been made by accident. Literally the moment it arrived at the French Institute in Cairo, the experts there recognized that this really was the way in which it might be possible to decipher hieroglyphs because there was Greek on the stone. The Greek was the key. For carved above the Greek inscription was the same message in the forgotten hieroglyphs of ancient Egypt. Because Greek was known to scholars, it provided the key to decoding the language of the pharaohs. Now, thousands of years of ancient Egyptian writings could be translated. 
After centuries of silence, Egyptian voices could be heard once more. As to any flooding on our land, it is you who are cultivating it, and you who are responsible for it. Work hard and be careful. If my lands flood, woe be to you. The letters of the Kanakite. One having a wound on his temple, treat the ailment with a poultice of fresh meat the first day. Treat afterwards every day with grease and honey until he recovers. The surgical papyrus. The sound of your voice is sweet, full like the taste of date wine. And I, drunken girl in a tangle of flowers, live only a captive to hear it. Love poem, circa 1300 BC. The discovery of the Rosetta Stone, along with the paintings of Napoleon's artists, provided the West with a window into the magical land of the pharaohs. Kings who built magnificent monuments and were rumored to have learned the secrets of eternal life. And the world fell in love with Egypt. Now, tourists and mystics, treasure hunters and archaeologists all descended on the valley of the Nile. The colossi don't look at all colossal. On the contrary, they're quite in keeping with everything about them, as if they were the natural size of man and we were dwarfs. Florence Nightingale, 1849. The temple's proportion puts in mind a giant buried up to its waist, overwhelming man's puny stature with its head and shoulders. We are amazed. Jean-Jacques Ampère, 1868. Who shall say it's not lively, exhilarating, lacerating, muscle straining, bone wrenching, and perfectly excruciating and exhausting pastime climbing the pyramids? Mark Twain, 1869. But of all Egypt's wonders, one captured the world's imagination like nothing else in human history. In the desert of the Giza Plateau, stoically surviving the swirling winds and grinding sands of nearly 5,000 years, they defined this society that dreamed of immortality. For the pyramids seemed to have defeated time itself. The world's most recognized symbol of the glory that was ancient Egypt, built as tombs, later gutted, robbed, battered by the centuries, and still they endure. There are more than 2.3 million blocks of limestone in the Great Pyramid of Cheops, each stone weighing from 2 to 15 tons. Its base is a near-perfect square. 481 feet tall, it could hold the equivalent of 872 wide-body jets. And still today, the mysteries abound. Where did the technology come from? How were they able to move such vast amounts of stone prior to the invention of the wheel? Perhaps most intriguing of all, who could have imagined all this possible? Eternal stone structures, the largest on Earth, when nothing, even a fraction of their size, had ever been built. The answer lies nine miles south, among the old kingdom tombs of Saqqara and the step pyramid of King Josa, the very first stone building in all the world. This was the laboratory that proved the Great Pyramids possible. Unlike anything the world had ever seen, it was so remarkable a feat of engineering, its architect, Imhotep, was proclaimed a god. Originally designing a simple, low-slung tomb called a mastaba, Imhotep wasn't satisfied. He added one layer then another, and another, and another, as if building steps to heaven. He 
He also tunneled deep into the earth, creating a labyrinth of chambers, galleries, and corridors designed to keep the king's true burial site secret and to protect the royal mummy from grave robbers. Down dark, twisting passageways, at every turn, in every detail, what Imhotep accomplished seems overwhelming still. There is no scientific uh, explanation given to the public to tell them how the pyramids was built. They never uh, left a papyrus roll or uh, a description in a stone to say how they did it. Today, it takes a 350 horsepower diesel engine and hydraulic lifter to pick up this seven ton granite slab. Many of the building blocks in the Great Pyramid weighed more than twice as much. Although no description or narrative account has ever been found telling how these massive stone monuments were created, this tomb drawing contains tantalizing clues. It shows the 160 workers needed to move a single statue. How many more must it have taken to build a pyramid? Many believe the stones were moved on enormous wood sleds along mud-slicked paths. Others think rolling logs were used, or even canals built from the Nile, and the stones floated in on barges. Ramps most likely raised the stones into place. But how they built on such a scale and with such uncanny precision is the greatest wonder of this great wonder of the world. The pyramids were built to house the pharaohs for eternity, but the stones would fail them. The tomb became a beacon, attracting as many robbers as it repelled, and Egypt became a land overrun by treasure seekers. There was no stopping the looting and plunder to come. A pharaoh's tomb was designed to protect his treasure and provide his mummy safe passage through eternity. But the lure of royal treasure was irresistible. Despite the royal architect's best efforts, the tombs were violated. The great stone walls could not protect the kings from the greed in the hearts of men. The intruders might be simple robbers, members of the king's own priesthood, or even the very builders of the tomb itself. Actual trial transcripts found on an ancient papyrus reveal their creed. We broke through and found the pharaoh lying at the rear of the tomb. We took all his possessions of gold, silver, and bronze and divided them between us. Amun Ponifer of Karnak, temple stone mason. And the plunder continued down through the centuries. In the unbridled looting of the 1800s, nothing was sacred. A giant head of Ramses was dragged from the desert and brought to the British Museum. I found it near the remains of its body and chair, apparently smiling at me at the thought of being taken to England. Gianni Belzoni, 1880. Even a man of science, the French archaeologist Auguste Mariette, left a trail of destruction in his wake. 
A brilliant scholar, Mariette, discovered the long-lost tomb of a cult that worshipped sacred animals 3,000 years ago. Deep under the ground in Sakura, a maze of catacombs contained massive stone coffins that once held mummies of full-grown bulls. Each granite chamber weighed 80 tons. And yet they too had been robbed, the lids pried open in ancient times by a force Mariette could not even begin to comprehend. Only one sarcophagus remained unopened, but Mariette and his men came well armed. Mariette was a product of his time, as greedy for treasure as for knowledge shamelessly indifferent to the desecration he would cause the sacred tombs. In the raw pillaging days, it was just, hey, let's get the biggest kind of stuff we can, and they blasted it with dynamite to get it out, and they dropped it in the Nile by mistake when the winches didn't work, and all sorts of chaos. They would take dynamite and set it at the edge of, of the pyramid. Wham! Just let it go to see, you know, is there a hole in there? Is there next to a burial chamber? And so on. Despite the best efforts of Egyptian authorities, illicit excavations continued. The most persistent offenders lived here, in Kurna, the village of the robbers. For generations, unscrupulous dealers came from all over the world to Kurna to purchase pieces of Egypt's past. A booming black market flourished in these narrow streets. In Kurna, trade in ancient treasure became a way of life. As a young man, Hussein Abu Del Rasul often dug for illicit artifacts. Kurna is built above a lot of artifacts and antiquities. No one really knows how much is buried underneath here. There are hundreds of tombs which are as yet unopened and undiscovered. But all the villagers, no exception, know the value of what they are living above. And whenever anyone can sell something, they do. The town is located on an ancient burial ground. Rumors spread of looters' tunnels, but more likely these were the long-since robbed graves of minor nobles and even commoners. The village of the robbers earned its reputation, but the worst looting was not the work of amateurs. This is plunder with a pedigree, plunder in the name of art and science, plunder to fill national museums all over the world. Museum curators are trained to acquire. They do three things. They acquire, they exhibit, and they publish. And the sexiest thing is to acquire. And the resentment of people living in the countries that were being pillaged finally got to the point where it had to be taken seriously by the industrial powers, who were the collectors. We don't want any more of this theft. And you people, who are the scholars, you people who are the curators, you're the ones that are egging them on. You're contributing to the, uh, the criminal behavior by saying, well, buy anything in sight. And they, 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 they could never get the runners. You can't get the night diggers. But you can sure get the people who say, uh, this is our newest acquisition, and put it on a pedestal in New York or Berlin or what have you. It gets pretty embarrassing. You know, the Egyptian civilization does not belong to Egypt only, but belongs to everyone, everyone all over the world. We as Egyptians are guardian to this civilization. And this is why we, all of us, Egyptians, Americans, Europeans, has to cooperate in stopping this crime. 
Protecting the country's rich heritage is now the job of Egypt's antiquities police. From his Cairo headquarters, Colonel Mechled leads a skilled unit of investigators, perhaps the best in the world at what they do. Any theft, large or small, constitutes a threat to our culture and heritage. It's a heavy responsibility. We aren't just fighting crime, we're protecting our past. I love this culture. When I hold a statue in my hands, I'm holding a piece of my heritage. I feel the continuity between the present and the past. But despite the best efforts of the antiquities police, the plunder continues. In 1992, a secluded temple was descended upon by a daring gang of thieves. Their target, one of the temple's most important and imposing relics. We got a report on the theft of the head of a huge statue from an area about 100 miles west of Aswan. Almost in the middle of the desert and very difficult to reach. This was a hugely important piece because it was a statue of Ramses the Great. In cases like this, everybody in the department, regardless of rank, pulls together to solve the theft and retrieve the stolen artifacts. Colonel Mechlid's team eventually captured the thieves and recovered the stolen head. But the damage had been done. Yet it was not stone, but flesh and blood, the mummies of ancient Egypt's greatest rulers, who would suffer the worst desecration of all. The pharaohs have not been left in peace. The fate of this mummy is not uncommon, only its ancestry is. This is the mummy of Tutankhamun, King Tut. Over the years, he has been rudely manhandled. But mummies suffered far worse indignities. They became the objects of bizarre rituals and beliefs. In medieval times, pounded up ancient Egyptian mummy was considered to be a powerful medicine to say nothing of an aphrodisiac. Pounded mummy was worn by the King of France in a leather pouch on his belt. A thriving market in what was called Mumia developed throughout Europe. And there were numerous instances in the late 18th and early 19th century of people throwing mummy unwrapping parties. And groups of doctors and scientists would get together and they would throw a reception and they would formally unwrap the mummy. And the collection of mummies from there became big business. For over a thousand years, human beings have been treated as display pieces, historical oddities, props for cheap magicians. But another chance discovery, more than a century ago, would forever change the way mummies were treated. Ironically, the astonishing find was made above the town of Kurna, the village of the robbers. Here, in a cave lay the coffins of 32 kings and queens, including the mummy of Ramses the Great. 3,000 years ago, their royal priests carefully identified each ruler and hid their remains in this secret burial chamber. For their own protection, Egyptian authorities now removed the royal mummies from their tombs. And this collection of ancient rulers formed a funeral procession unique in human history. Along the Nile, Egyptians gathered to pay their respects 
as the eerie caravan of ancient rulers made its final journey north to Cairo. Today, a century later, Ramses and all the royal mummies lie in an upper gallery of the Cairo Museum. A unique conservation effort is underway to preserve the ancient pharaohs, to finish the task their priests began. But now, scientists have taken the place of holy men as the final protectors of the royal mummies. Dr. Nasri Iskander is moving a once mighty king to an unfamiliar resting place. Steel and glass have replaced the stone and jewels of his original tomb. The casing will be filled with an inert gas to reduce further damage to the mummies. Ending a journey that began in the 12th century BC, this royal mummy will now rest in peace protected by 20th century technology. This is the best way. Uh, it simulates the atmosphere inside the tombs itself, in the old times. Every time I see this, I feel a deep feeling. And you see that man face to face. It's an unforgettable moment. It's very difficult to explain things like this, but I, I feel I'm a part of this. It's our history, and now the world is history. It may be that what makes Egypt so mysterious and majestic is that traces of the humble have all but disappeared, erased by the passage of time. Our vision is of the exotic, the monumental buildings and the royal treasures of dazzling and inspired beauty. It is the fabulous trappings of priests and magicians, the resting places of queens and kings which survive. But the things that really ground us are the mummies, the preserved faces of the men and women who lived life to its fullest and who died hoping that their perfect lives along the Nile were never really over. Here, now, they are closer to eternity than they have ever been. <laughs> 